Hello, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Corey Glassman. I'm the Global Training Manager for Fluke Corporation. And today we have Jim Davis with us, Regional Marketing Engineer for Fluke Networks. He's been working in the cabling industry for over 25 years. The program that we're gonna be talking about today is field testing of installed cabling for industrial environments. Uh, your microphones have been muted for this presentation. If you do have a question, please type it into the question window and we'll be able to address it. Um, also, Jim's objective is to bring the experience of the industry and the lab to the customer and present it in a way that the common user can understand. Jim? Oh, good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction, Corey. Well, my name is Jim Davis. I work with Fluke Networks. I've worked here 20 years as of last Friday, so that's pretty exciting. We work a lot talking about cable testing, and today we're going to be talking about cable testing in an industrial environment, similar to the office environment, but with some important differences. I understand that we're gonna have a wide understanding of cabling in the audience, and I'm going to try to speak both to the people who are new to industrial ethernet, new to category cabling, and also throw in some tidbits for those of you who have some pretty extensive experience with cabling. So let's dive into it. It's mandatory that I throw in a couple of marketing slides here, and my boss is on the line, so uh, she'll be able to make sure that I did cover this. Fluke Networks makes test equipment. We don't make cable, we don't make connectors, we don't do the installation. Our customers are the control engineers, the industrial electricians who have to get the network set up, fix the networks if they're broken, check the networks if they're broken. The data contractors use our test equipment to make sure the cabling has been properly installed and show their customers that it's been properly installed. And the network managers use our equipment. I'm gonna come up with a statistic that half of the problems in cabling, half of the problems on the network are caused by the cabling, but I'm sure that people suspect the cabling in at least 80, if not 100% of the situations. So if we are able to answer the question, is it or is it not the cabling, the sooner we can say it's not the cabling, the sooner we can move forward and looking on to where the real problem might be. All right, so one last comment about Fluke Networks. We've been doing this for a long time. We've been making cable testers more than 20 years. And the thing that works nicely about our cable testers, they're very reliable, they're very robust, they're designed to work in the field, and they're very accurate. If the Fluke says it's passing, it's going to pass. There's one thing that ties together the DSP, the DTX, the new DSX testers, and that's our results management software, Linkware. Nobody wants to, but somebody once told me that nobody wants to buy a drill. They want a hole. Nobody wants to buy a cable tester. That hurts, but I understand. What you need is working cabling. The cable tester is the drill. Linkware, the test results are the hole that we deliver. This cabling is going to be working. And one of the nice things about this software, all the test results, copper, fiber, loss, OTDR testing, all in one simple platform, makes it easier to manage the results and easier to read them. So as promised, <laughs> we've gone out, we've surveyed hundreds of people, plant technicians, design people, manufacturers of the active equipment, and said, where do you see challenges with industrial ethernet? And time and again, people come back and say, it's a cabling issue. It's a physical layer issue. The cable's too long, the cable's broken, the connector's not working, there's noise on the line. What kind of tools can people use when they're trying to solve those problems? They may have some type of network discovery program. They may, if they're clever, have managed switches and use the information, the SNMP information from those switches to tell them information about challenges they're finding on the network. Now, if they can't connect to the switch, that's not gonna help a lot. And a switch may report what looks like a cabling problem, and the switch may even be able to run a test, but you can't run the test until the switch is installed. 
and while it may report a problem, it's the cable tester that's going to tell you where that problem is. We hear a lot of people using Wireshark. Oh, get Wireshark, let's break out Wireshark. It's a very, very powerful tool. A microscope to your network protocols, great for giving you information on timing, occupation of traffic on the network, terrible for telling you the distance to where a cable is broken. And finally, they'll have a little LED tester where, hey, if there's continuity on the cable, the light bulb will come on. This is a good start, but it's not gonna tell you the distance to where the open is, and it's not going to confirm that a cable is able to support gigabit ethernet. Just a quick explanation here of two different levels of tools. They're tools that sometimes we talk about certifying a network against a standard. In the industrial world, I hear a lot of people talking about verifying the cabling. And I wanna differentiate these certification or verification tools against a wire map tool. They're going to test against what's written in the standards. The common cabling standards we see, the TIA 568 or the ISO 11801 standard. Now on the other side, we have qualification tools, like those little LED testers. Now, these are helpful to tell you if there's continuity, but they're not going to talk about signal strength or interference that we have on the line. Cabling standards, a little bit different from code. Standard is just a recommendation. Code is the law, you have to do it. You don't have to follow cabling standards, but cabling standards are the recommendation of the industry. They're the experience of the industry. What has worked for us and what hasn't? You may disagree with the standard, please. They're always looking for people to sit on the standards committee. Tell them a better way to do it, but appreciate that the standards are excellent guidance and if you follow the standards, things should work. The standards that apply to cabling, we're going to talk about the ANSI TIA, that's the Telecommunications Industry Association 568 standard. That's what is most commonly used in North America. There's also an international standard, the ISO 11801, and these two standards are very similar in what they're calling out. Now, within the 568 standard, there are different premise standards. We're very familiar with the commercial building standard, also called the 568. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the TI 1005, which is designed for industrial environments. Now, let me just give a quick plug of the standards. I look at the TI 568 standard as something that literally defines, let's use an analogy here to talk about the shape of the road, how wide the lanes are. I like this idea of what is the minimum height of the overpass. I wanna know the height of the overpass because if I design the road properly, then the people who write the application standards or the protocol, Ethernet is the IEEE 802.3 standard, those vehicles are going to run on that road. Now, if I followed the standard when I was doing the installation of the cabling, my applications are going to be, are going to work on the first try. And when we're starting up, a new machine, we've shut down, we're putting a new packaging line on the end of on the end of our factory. We don't want to waste time. We don't want to find out that the cabling's bad and we're gonna be shut down for two days. We're packaging milk. Let's tell the cows to stop producing milk while we get that fixed. No, we want the cabling to work. And if we follow the standards and we upgrade our application, that new faster, better application should work on the first try. We've got a couple of poll questions today. We'd like to get your feedback on what we're talking about here. Corey, do you want to toss out that first question here? You bet. So in this one, we're asking, what industrial Ethernet protocol do you use most in your plant? Uh, so please choose one of those, and I'll leave this open for a few moments as uh, Jim talks through this. Actually, I'm not going to talk. <laughs> I'm going to give people a couple of moments to answer. Now, when I talk about the 568 standard, we generally, especially in the copper world, we don't talk about doing certification to an application. We don't certify to 10 megabits. We don't certify to Profinet. We certify against Category 5E or category six, because the requirements for a category 5E pipe are a superset of the requirements for Profinet or for Ethernet IP. I'm gonna say we've got enough answers here. Let's okay, I think we do. We have about 65, 67% of the folks 
that have given us an answer, and actually the majority are Ethernet IP. Okay, super. That's very interesting. We can guess here what people are doing in the field, but it's uh, it's very helpful to get that direct feedback. All right, so moving right along. Why do I need to test the cabling? I've got great jacks, great cable. I've got an installer who has a piece of paper that he was in one of your presentations, Jim. Isn't that enough? No, we want to make sure that the installed cabling meets the performance. It's a way that people get paid for the job. Yes, before you pay the person who did the installation of the cabling, one of the parts of the bid package should be to receive the test results. That shows you that the cable has been installed properly. Our experience shows time and time again, certified, run, certified networks run faster. We're going to have fewer physical layer errors. And that cable is going to be in the wall a long time. It's easier to change the device that's on each end. We can upgrade to a newer, faster switch or access point easily, but changing the cable, that's difficult. I talked about reducing the startup time, and if there is downtime, and we suspect the cable. Let's find it quickly. And I always throw in a note here to be careful of the people who offer to save money by not doing the certification. Oh, oh I, my, my company, we only have one tester and it's at another job site. Okay, why did I hire you? <laughs> Rent a tester, come on. But, but we'll give you a discount if we don't have to certify. Oh, please don't tell my boss. Another thing that scares me is the people who come along and say, our cabling is so good, it doesn't need to be certified. Really? <laughs> if your cabling was so good, you would test it and show me how good it is. Remember, you've been advised? <laughs> I don't want to say warned, that's too strong. So, for those of you who are new to Ethernet, let's talk about what we do to make sure that Ethernet is going to work. Just having continuity or the correct wire map is not enough to assure that we're going to be able to support gigabit ethernet. What we do to check for the ethernet is measure how much signal there is. Actually, we're gonna measure the signal loss. And then we measure noise that's on the line. Now this is noise that the transmitting equipment is generating itself. There are two main parameters near and crosstalk and return loss. So we put together this signal and noise to create a signal to noise ratio. And if we have more signal than noise, communications can happen. Now, before we start, yeah, we absolutely need continuity. And here's a screen showing us the four pairs, blue, orange, green, brown, a slate when you've got a five pair situation, very uncommon. And most often I see people using an RJ45 connector, registered jack number 45, it's an eight position connector. It has some deficiencies we'll talk about in a minute, but it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Every computer, every switch, every wireless access point, they all use the same connector. When I travel internationally, I dream about having an RJ45 so I don't have to bring a bag full of adapter plugs for the different power outlet in England, in France, in Argentina, always something different. Now in the industrial world, we're also gonna use some more heavy duty connectors. The M12 series is what I see most often outside of the RJ45. There are two versions of the M12 that we see in the data world. The decoded, I'm told that stands for data, which uses two pairs of cable. Two pairs of cable will give us 100 megabit. That's pretty good. And more recently, they've launched the X-coded, X for Roman numeral 10 or 10 gigabit ethernet that actually runs four pairs. So the most common problem that we see is a bad wire map. Somebody doesn't have continuity on all four pairs. Cable tester is great about telling us the distance to where we have an open. It's actually showing us the, the, open, the distance to open from both ends. Sometimes somebody might flip the pairs. And I've been told that if you have a flipped pair, you'll see here somebody switched the, the solid and the striped pair on one end or the other. They've said that the cable tester can't tell you which end it's flipped on. Well, I have to tell you, if it's me and someone else working, it's on the other guy's end. <laughs> now, you may doubt this, but you can tell the guy on the other end. You heard it from the flute guy in his webinar. I'm kidding about that, of course. 
not really. Another thing that we can show is a short. A lot of times we'll be working with a shielded cable and maybe that braid wire will poke through the insulation or someone will hammer a nail into the wall or staple the cable on. That'll give us a short. We use to the short. There are two common wiring codes that we use, the 568A and the 568B. 568B is most common in the United States, uh, but if somebody wires one end A and one end B, we're going to get these flipped pairs here. And one of the more insidious problems with the wire map is something that we call a split pair. Now, the fun thing about the split pair is you'll notice that the striped blue conductor goes to the striped blue conductor and the striped brown conductor goes to the striped brown conductor. If you're using one of those simple LED continuity testers or just a light bulb and a battery, they're going to show continuity on these pairs, but they're not paired. And when the pairs are broken, we're going to have serious problems with noise. All right. So let's take a look at that signal strength parameter I talked about. So we don't actually measure how much signal, but we measure the loss of the signal. We call this insertion loss or attenuation. We're going to transmit a signal with a given amplitude down the cable, and on the far end, we're going to listen to hear how much loss there is. So we measure the loss of the signal in decibels versus the frequency. And this is actually the measured value, the bottom line here, and the top line that we're looking at that's the height of the overpass. We want to make sure that we're not exceeding the height of the overpass. So one thing about insertion loss is it increases with length. Putting a laser pointer here on the end of a shorter cable, this is about 20 meters, call it about 60 feet. We've got a limit of 100 meters. Now if I use a longer cable, you'll see we have more insertion loss with the longer cable. Another thing that causes the insertion loss is higher frequencies. Notice we're going up into the right, higher frequencies, higher insertion loss, and temperature is also going to have an impact. The cabling is designed to work at an ambient temperature of 20 degrees C, about 70 Fahrenheit, but if we're in a hotter environment, that is going to reduce the distance that we can reach. And yeah, we'll tell stories about the cabling was run over an oven heating ceramics and when we tested it the first time it worked we turned the oven on the system stopped we had to turn it off to be able to get close to it to test it and it passed it didn't look like it was the cabling but if your ambient temperature is exceeding 20 degrees c the standard actually calls out a derating factor or a maximum length that you can use for your links one of the nice things about linkware is you can sort your cables by length to find out what are your longest cables so that signal, now we're going to look at different noise parameters. The first noise we're going to talk about is return loss. Return loss is like an echo on the line. We're going to transmit a signal down the pair, and we're going to listen for a reflected signal. Now, technically, this is caused by variations in the impedance, but the impedance variations are caused by a cable that's poorly made. The copper conductors have different distances. When you change the distance between the conductors, that changes the impedance or damaged cable. I often see in office environments where they ran the cable into the modular furniture and bent it around the furniture, or perhaps where they strapped it to the legs of the machine using a cable tie, and they pulled that on tight to make sure that it's not going to come off. Separating the pairs too much when you do the termination. And another thing that we may see in an industrial environment is getting water in the cable. When the water soaks into the jacket, it's going to change the impedance. So in our return loss graph, this is showing us all four pairs here, the strength of the reflected signal against the frequency. If we have water in the cable, we're going to get this cryptical graph. Don't worry, this isn't going to be on the test at the end of the day. And if you have the situation, a good cable tester is going to tell you what the problem is. That's really helpful when you're trying to get it up and running again. Now, the, the other noise I want to talk to you about is near-end crosstalk. Near-end crosstalk, or next, is the interference from one pair to an adjacent pair. In the olden days, when you had a telephone in your house, you could pick up the phone and you might hear somebody else's conversation leaking through. The same thing here. We're going to transmit a signal on one pair, and we're going to listen on the adjacent pair for any signal that is induced to jump over. If we listen on the near end, that'll be next or near end crosstalk. And if we listen on the far end, fext or far end crosstalk. Now, next comes from, well, our friend the RJ45. Works great, runs 10 gigabits Ethernet. But by putting the 4 5 pair inside of the 3 6 pair, 
that increases the near-end crosstalk. Again, bad cable might cause this problem, not maintaining the twist. Another thing that causes next is using either the wrong limit or the wrong category of cable. Well, I'm going to test everything to category 6A because 6A has the best performance. That's great, but if you installed category 5E cable or air quotes accidentally installed some category 3 cable, not because it was less expensive, that cable is not going to pass those performance limits. It's going to have great continuity but too much noise. So I want to throw out one more poll question here. We're curious to know, what are the types of connectors that you're using? Corey, can you toss that question up there for everyone for us, please? You bet. And here we go. In this case, you can check all that apply. Is all that apply actually an answer on there? Uh, you could check as many as you wish. <laughs> Sorry, I get you carried can away. You all of them if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're over 50% of voted, so we'll leave it open a few moments longer. 63%, right. 67, 8. Super. Thanks for your feedback, everyone. And in this case, most people are reporting RJ45, and second to that seems to be fiber connectors. Okay, super, that's very helpful. All right, should okay. we keep going here? Yep. All right. There we go, thank you. Okay, so let's put it all together. Let's combine the signal and the noise. And this, we're going to talk here about the attenuation to crosstalk ratio, where we measure the signal strength against the crosstalk. And this really is going to form kind of the basis of the difference between a category 5E. Here we see a category 5E limit line. There's the height of the overpass for category 5E. And that goes out to 100 megahertz. Category 5E can support 10 and 100 megabits Ethernet. It can even support gigabit Ethernet. More recently, they've introduced something called NBase-T, where we can run 2.5 and, and even 5 gigabits Ethernet on category 5E cable. Now, we're pushing the limit to try and run 5 gigabits on category 5E. So sometimes I see customers installing category 6 to give them a little bit of extra margin. I'm going to leave my laser pointer here at the top of the, well, the bottom, if you will, <laughs> of the overpass. So you see that when we switch to category six, not only are we going higher up, we've got a stricter limit for the noise, but we're also going to go out to 250 megahertz, giving us more bandwidth to work with. Now, category six, in addition to giving us some margin to support those I hate to call five gigabits a lower speed application, <laughs> but category six, we can run 10 gigabits out to about 50 meters, uh, about 150 feet. And then there's category 6A. Category 6A is going to fully support 10 gigabits out to 100 meters, and we go all the way out to 500 megahertz. Certainly, there'll be new applications that can run on that. Category eight, anyone? Moving right along. If there's nothing else that you take away from this presentation today, it's these next couple of slides. I want you to be comfortable reading a test report. When somebody brings you a test report, ooh, look how pretty that is. It's got lines and graphs and numbers, prop delay, delay skew, resistance. We'll talk about those another day. But there are two fields that I want you to be able to read on these test reports to make sure it's been done right. The first thing to check, it may seem obvious, but did the test pass? There are test limits that are document only that didn't don't give us a pass or a fail. So we want to make sure the test passed. And the other field that we want to look at that's very important is what is the test limit? So this one was tested against category six, the permanent link limits. It's not that I don't trust people, but it's probably easier to get a cable to pass category six if I can't get it to pass category 6A, then going out and running the cable through the walls again. So if you asked for category 6A, this isn't covering it. It's just category 6. All right. Well, Jim, that's great, all this office stuff. But we're in an industrial environment. It's harsh. I've got a 100 horsepower motor here. I've got transformers. I've got a row of arc welders, temperatures. 
how are we going to handle this with Ethernet? Well, within the TIA 1005, the premise standard, we start to talk about these MICE classifications. And this is a toughness rating, if you will, that shows different limits, different requirements for the performance of the cable and the connectors as we go from an office environment, a carpeted environment, into an industrial environment. So different information here. Uh, there may be some mechanical stress on it. That may be a reason that we switch from an RJ45 to an M12 connector. There may be water or dust. Harvey always likes to bring up the example of they have to wash down the food production area with a fire hose. <laughs> That's going to be tough on our friend, the RJ45 connector. There may be toxic chemicals. There may be oil. We don't want to have our indoor rated category five cables soaking in oil or water. We've seen the impact of that. And then our friend electromagnetic interference. We're going to talk about this electromagnetic interference a little bit more because the EMI is where I hear the most concern of people saying a physical shock, a mechanical shock, a cable soaking in water. I can see that it's soaking in water, but I can't see the electromagnetic interference. And I'm worried that it's going to get on the wire and it's going to corrupt my frames. It's going to cause these CRC or FCS errors. If we get a physical layer error, we need to retransmit. And one of the ways that that retransmission manifests itself is the network being slow. You may not see it happening. So technically, a CRC error is caused by the checksum generated by the transmitting device, not matching the one generated by the receiving device. As I mentioned, you may not know that this is happening. This is something to look for in your SNMP agent. It's really helpful if you have managed switches. If you have managed switches that you're using in your network, you have a device looking for noise, looking for CRC and FCS errors on every one of your ports. Now, this can be especially painful if you have an application with a request packet interval that's short. Our favorite story is the security system. Yes, we're going through an industrial process. It's dangerous. We need to make sure that the security system is running to make sure there are no people underneath that boiling oil that we're moving. So we check, hey, security system, are you on? And the security system says, yes, I'm on. Security system, are you on? Yes, I'm on. Security system, are you on? Oh, I didn't get an answer. Let me check again. Are you there? I didn't get an answer. Let's shut down the plant because I'm not, there's nothing wrong, but I'm not getting an answer from the security system. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to drill a little bit more into the CRC error. Hopefully you'll appreciate this explanation. Talked about Wireshark. Here is a packet capture and decode from a protocol analyzer. This is what the Ethernet packet looks like on the wire. Sometimes it's even decoded. Yeah, that's where your password comes out. So I'm going to try and simplify this, and here's our basic Ethernet frame. At the beginning of the frame, we have the destination address, where it's going to. That's followed by the source address, where it's coming from. Some protocol information. Is this HTTP? Is this voice over IP? Is this Profinet? The actual data, the cargo that we're sending, yes, uh, the security system is still on. Now at the end of the frame here, we're going to put our cyclical redundancy check or frame checksum that makes sure that the bits and the bytes are in the right sequence. So if I send an on off on off down the wire, I want to check what I received. And if what I received is on off on off, CRC is good, everything continues. But if I send that same on off on off down the wire and we get some interference, I may get on 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 off. That doesn't match what I transmitted. I have a, a CRC error and at the physical layer this frame gets tossed out. Don't worry, Ethernet is robust. It will retransmit the frame if needed, but it's gone. And if that noise is persistent, the frames aren't going to get through. So how do we avoid this problem? Well, there are two ways, eh, three ways if we include fiber optic cable. <laughs> but let's talk about ways to avoid this in the copper world. In the copper world, one of the ways to avoid it is using a shielded cable. There are different types of shields that we can use. We can have an individual shield, an overall shield, or both an individual and an overall shield. You want to make sure that you're using shielded jacks in a shielded patch panel when you're doing that. When we're testing the shield, some of our older testers would 
and of course the competitors, will just look for continuity on the shield. And here, even though the shield is open, by connecting the two metallic conductive jacks, we've created a low impedance path between the shield conductor, and it looks like we have continuity on the shield. With our new cable tester, we look to make sure that the shield follows the path of the cable when we're working with a four pair cable. So even though there is a conductive path between the shield conductors here, we're able to tell that the shield does not follow the path of the cable. Very helpful if we're trying to find where a shield is open. Now, another way that we avoid noise is by having a well-balanced link. That is an electrically balanced link. And this is why UTP, unshielded twisted pair, works. So I need to transmit a signal that's plus two volts. What I'm gonna do is on one leg of the pair, I'm gonna send plus one volt. On the other leg of the pair, 180 degrees out of phase, I'm gonna send minus one volt. Now, on this cable that is electrically balanced, each leg of the pair has very similar electrical characteristics to the other one. Again, this is a simplified story, but work with me here. We get some electromagnetic interference. It's induced with the, in an equal amount and it's treated the same way as it continues down the wire. So, sorry to make you guys on the East Coast do math now, but let's take a look at this. <laughs> we have plus one, plus a half volt, gives us one and a half volts. Now our minus one volt, plus a half volt gives us minus a half volt. We maintain that two volt differential. Our signal gets through in spite of the noise. If our cable is not well balanced, we're not able to cancel out that noise and that's going to cause interference for us. Appreciating the work of our friends on the Fluke Industrial side, wanted to give a quick plug for one of their motor drive analyzers, and we can see the noise as it appears on the waveform here. Now, how do we measure the balance of the cable to make sure that it is well balanced and has the noise immunity? I want to introduce you to a concept we call TCL, or transverse conversion loss. Technically, and don't be scared by this, Technically, transverse conversion loss, we're going to transmit a differential mode signal down the pair and measure the common mode noise that comes back to us. Let's just simplify this and say that cables that have better TCL performance have better noise immunity. And let's look at what test limits we might think about using when we are doing our certification. Here we see within the tester the test limits for the channel and the permanent link for the TI-1005 and for the ISO 11801 standards. Because I'm in North America today, we're gonna to talk about those TI-1005 limits. We see the common permanent link and the channel limit. It's the channel limits that I find most often in industrial environments because I don't need an administration point. <laughs> this is always going to be a, a, a sensor on the production line. I'm not going to switch it out for a, a printer or a scanner or some other type of device. So the channel measurement includes all the components in the link, even any patch cords that we might use. Now, the new limit that you see here, here is a category six channel limit with this cryptical E1. And we also see E2 and E3. Those values come from our MICE requirements, the E in MICE, the electromagnetic requirements. Now, between E1, 2, and 3, the insertion loss, the attenuation limits, the near end crosstalk, the return loss limits are all exactly the same. What's different between these is the TCL value, the balance of the cable, the cable's immunity to noise becomes more stringent. Again, in a basic TI-1005 test, here we have the basic TI-1005 test, there is no requirement in field testing to measure TCL or TCL's friend, ELTCTL. But if we select one of these plus all limits, the standard defines what the values are for TCL and equal level transverse conversion transfer loss, but you're not required to run the test in the field. If you select a limit with this plus all, then we will include the standards-based limits for this. Now, I'm going to drill into this a little bit more. Sorry for those of you who are new to cabling. Bear with me for a second. We'll get back to the regular stuff in a moment. But here are the limits by frequency 
in decibels for E1 to E2 to E3. And here they are graphed out the strength of the TCL, the strength of the reflected differential mode signal that comes back to us versus the frequency. This is going to 250 megahertz. So this would be category six, correct? And if we go to E2, you see that the values are tighter for the TCL values. That represents better noise immunity. And E3, again, will be the strictest limits that will represent the greatest noise immunity on a link. All right, so people see this and they say, hey, help me out. What should I specify in my bid document? How do I make sure that I get the best noise immunity? Well, I'm not the person to ask. I don't know what you're doing on your network. Check with your consultant, your architect, your engineer. They're the ones who are going to know what are the components that you're using. It's nice to say, I want category 6E with E3 limits, but if you're not installing category 6A components, you're not installing components that can pass the E3 requirements, you're just going to fail those tests. What are the applications that you're planning to support? Well, I've got a fan that's way down the hall and I need to know if that fan is on or off. You probably don't need 10 gigabits <laughs> to find out if the fan is on or off. 10 megabits might be great there. But if you've got some kind of uh, image application that's sending a high amount of data, yeah, you're going to need something better. What is the nature of the environment? I had a customer the other day, their cabling was on the roof of a television station. They had a little bit of interference there. <laughs> the technicians had to wear a radiation detector while they were walking on the roof. <laughs> That might be an E3 environment. These factors are going to come into play to help your consultants define what limits they should use. And on our webpage, we actually have a Division 27, a nine-page document of possible test limits that you can plug into your specifications. And I can actually hear you saying, nine pages, are you crazy? You'll be lucky if you get one cell of an Excel file <laughs> to specify what you're going to say. But if that's all you have, I want to throw this out as an idea, as a starting point. The links are going to be tested against the ANSI TIA 568.2 for copper. D is the most current revision for the category 5E6, 6A, whatever you're specifying. Now, in the tester, you want to call out the TI-568, uh, TI, oh, excuse me, the TI-1005 limits. Category 5E is going to be a starting point. And let's include those TCL values. That'll be the E1. That's just a good starting point. If you're using higher performance components, you can go with that. All right. That's it for the technical stuff. You've survived. Now a quick commercial plug, and I appreciate everyone listening for so long. How do we test this? What equipment do we use for this? Well, we've been using the Versive test platform. The Versive platform has copper capabilities and fiber testing. We're going to use fiber for going longer distances. We're going to use fiber when we're up on the roof with all those antennas. The first thing that we need to do with fiber is inspect the end face to make sure that it's clear. Here we're looking at a fiber optic cable. We've got our 50 micron core, our 125 micron cladding. And let me just say, this is a beautiful clean connector. And I notice it's in Spanish, conectado. Now, if I conectado this, to another connector that has a fingerprint on it. This is why I push inspection so much. Please make sure your connectors are clean. This is where people screw up their connectors, this and finding their fiber cable with backhoes. But putting a simple fingerprint on it, when we put them together, yuck, that's not going to improve our communications. We call this the coffee cup stain. Now, remember, the width of this connector is less than the thickness of a human hair. That's why we're using a video microscope. It's real small. Now, the fun story is here's connector one and here's connector two. 
the link doesn't work. So we add connector three, but connector three also gets dirty. Another thing we can do with the Versive tester is measure the loss. People ask me, how do I find out if this cable can support 10 gigabits ethernet? We don't use an OTDR to see if a cable will support 10 gigabit ethernet. OTDR is a great tool. It will show us the length of the fiber, but it doesn't tell us how much light comes out the far end. To know if we'll support an application, we need to know how much light's coming out the far end. So the standard defines tier one testing or loss testing. Uh, here we have a light source and a power meter and a light source on a power meter. We can test a single fiber, but oftentimes fiber are in pairs. So we can use the Versa platform to measure the loss. And if we have too much loss, or if the big yellow fiber finder mentioned in the prior example has found the fiber, the big yellow fiber finder, it's big, it's yellow, it's got a arm and a claw on the end of it, it's this caterpillar on the side, we'll use the optical time domain reflectometer to find the distance to where the fibers open. The OTDR shows us the strength of the reflected signal in decibels versus the distance to where the event happened. This fiber ends, eh, call this about 320 meters, eh, call it 700 feet. Don't worry, you don't have to interpret <laughs> this graph in the OTDR. A modern OTDR is going to have an expert module. And the expert module, yes, I know the people who can read the OTDR have been screaming at me, Jim, the problem's right there. And there's the expert module telling us, hey, you've got a problem right there, about 200 meters from the start of the fiber. So in the industrial world, we've even come out with a special version of our Versive kit to support industrial applications. This is going to be our DSX2-5 industrial ethernet kit one. Now what's special about the kit one is in addition to those RJ45 channel adapters, we've also included the adapters to connect to the M12, both the X and the decode M12 adapters. Comes with all the accessories for you to get started, main and a remote, and the two copper modules. And as I was mentioning before, we can add fiber modules on that. Now, please save your test results. It shows that we fixed the problem. It shows that the cabling's not the problem. I hear great feedback from the customers. They really like Linkware. It's easy to use. It's easy to interpret. We can send those test results up to the cloud, Linkware Live, a free cloud service. And what are we going to look for on this test result? Did it pass? What's the test limit? Now, you guys are more familiar with Fluke than I am, and there are many other products that we make for industrial automation. Outside of the Fluke Networks world, we have the motor drive analyzers. Those help us to validate signal integrity. They can help us to look at communications or drive signals. And within the Fluke Networks world, we have some simpler test equipment to help us find the distance to an open. That could be a cable IQ or the new microscanner MSPOE has been real helpful because it tells us what class of POE service is being offered. The micro mapper for continuity, uh, fiber optic cleaning and test tools, and all day long, the tone generator and the probe. What port on the patch panel does this cable connect to? Now, let's wrap this all up, summarizing. Use the standard, certify against the 568 standard. That will make sure that the 5E or category six components you purchased when they're installed meet those requirements. I'll mention it again, did it pass? And I like the idea of using, again, the the 1005 is a subset of the 568 standard, and these plus all limits are going to add in that TCL, the balance measurement, the noise immunity measurement that we talked about. Using the right tools is going to reduce your startup time and minimize any cabling related downtime. Before we open it up for questions, and I'm sure there have been a couple that have come in, we have one final poll question. There's got to be a commercial part to this. Corey, you want to send that out to everyone? You bet. They have it. All right, super. And while you're doing that, let me dive in and take a look at some of these questions that have been coming in. Again, if you have any questions for me, uh, go ahead and send those through the chat window. Looks like we've got two or three here. 
Yep, there's there's one that I can see, actually a couple. Uh, you might see the same thing, Jim, but uh, can I save test results with the micro scanner? All right. <laughs> I appreciate it. I spent an hour talking about our great cable certification tool, and the people are price conscious. I appreciate that. Um, I'm sorry, but no, the micro scanner, great tool, will show you the distance to the open, but you can't save the test results with it. The the I hate to call it lower end because it's a really capable tool, but the Cable IQ is the least expensive solution that we offer that you can use to both test a cable to find that you have continuity and length, and the Cable IQ also allows you to save the test results. Uh, there's also one additional one that I show. <clears throat> Will the Fluke tester check for shield continuity if I don't turn on the shield test. Oh, well, that's a, I, I, I'm glad you asked that one and not the other question, whether or not I have to have continuity on my shield for it to work right, because that's a whole different webinar <laughs> and uh, gets into some, uh, some, some strong feelings. But that's a, that's a perceptive question. Um, it, let me address both. Do I need continuity on the shield all the way from one end to the other? That depends, and you're gonna get different answers. But that's an interesting question about measuring the shield continuity. The DSX 5000 and the DSX 8000 will always check for continuity in the shield, even if you are not using a shielded cable. Now this can be helpful if you know that you are connecting two buildings or two different sections of the building that don't share the same ground and you don't want to create a new conductive path between two different grounds. So yes, it will show you whether or not there's continuity on the shield. Uh, could you please explain the split pair concept with a little more detail in this is this an EMF concern? Do you have certification training for industrial ethernet available? Okay, absolutely. Sorry, let's go back here. There are a lot of different wire map problems and in the past I've felt silly about spending time on wire map problems because it seemed obvious to me. Now, as I talk to customers, they've come back and said, this is where we have the most problems. And so let's take a look at this and help our technicians to understand it. So in the case of a split pair, here is pair one. So the orange, the solid orange and the striped conductor of orange are twisted together. The solid green and the striped conductor of green are twisted together. That creates the pair which allows us to have the balanced communication, which allows us to take advantage of the noise immunity of the unshielded twisted pairs. Now, the solid blue conductor and the striped blue conductor should be twisted together. And well, they are twisted together under the jacket and the brown pair and the striped pair of brown are twisted together. What's happened in this situation is it was dark. They couldn't see especially the striped pair. Sometimes the striped pair doesn't have a stripe and it just has a white jacket on it or there's bad lighting. Hopefully the installer wasn't colorblind. And it could happen between any one of these pairs. This one just happens to be the striped brown pair and the striped blue pair. At the connector, those were switched. So I no longer have pairs. I have correct connectivity on both ends, but the cables aren't in pairs anymore. And that destroys the TCL, that destroys the electromagnetic effect of creating the pair. And again, what's insidious about this, I remember back to, I don't know, I was seven years old and my parents got me an electrical kit and that's what cursed me to work at Fluke all this time. <laughs> and with my little electrical kit, I would plug in a wire from a switch to one terminal of a lamp and I would plug in a wire from from the other, con the other pole of the switch to the other conductor of the lamp. And when I 
closed the switch and made a conductive path between the battery and the lamp, the light would go on. Well, those simple LED testers work the same way. Do I have a conductive path? The light will go on. But in order to find that you have a split pair, you actually need to run a resistance test. And it's when we're doing the resistance test that we see that these two pairs are not actually in pairs. And that means that we're not going to have the noise immunity, which is going to generate those CRC and FCS errors. And I'll go, I have continuity, why is this not working? Let me call the manufacturer of the active equipment, maybe I'm putting in a camera, and let me call the camera manufacturer and say, this camera is not working. And let me call the switch manufacturer and say, this switch is not working, I want a new one. And hey, they're good for customer service, they'll send you a new one for a price, and you put price if nothing else, time, and you put the new one on both ends and you plug it in and you turn it on, and oh my gosh, the new one didn't work. You need to use a micro scanner or a cable IQ at least to see that you have this resistance, resistive problem by the split pair. Sorry for the long answer, but I hope that clears that up. Thank you very much for that question. There we go. Um, so there is a question, would I be able to use the fluke tester on the other cable types to find an open or to prove out continuity like Profibus cable? It'd be great to utilize your tools for more than just one application. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Profibus cables, um, any paired cable, we're going to be able to find the distance to an open. The DSX 5000 operates out to 1,000 meters, 3,000 feet. Um, so, in the data world, any it could be a simple voice cable. We often get questions about voice cables. Somebody still has to install a PBX because they like the re reliability of the telephone system and not using a cell phone to make communications. The Versive unit can also help to check basic network connectivity. We have a network test port. If you want to find out if there's a switch on the far end, you can plug that into your Versive and you can use the Versive to do network connectivity. And again, all the fiber capabilities, the ability to do fiber inspection, uh, the ability to do fiber loss testing, and the we've got a couple of different OTDR modules so we can do basic I'll call it basic short distance <laughs> fiber links, point to point fiber links. But now we're finding people doing passive optical networking, PON or PON LAN, where they put a splitter and they run fiber from point to multi point. We can do loss testing and OTDR testing on those passive optical networks. That's actually a new technology that's starting to get some traction in a couple different places. So, uh, Versa platform does have some capabilities around. Uh, different types of uh, communications networks and different cabling. Perfect. Um, I don't know if you addressed this question. Do you have uh, certification training for industrial Ethernet available right now? Where can I find the reference for this, prices, locations, and the such? Okay. The testing that we do now is a little bit more general. Uh, we have a program that we call CCTT, that's Certified Cabling Test Technician. This is a two-day class, uh, one day of copper, one day of fiber. Great class. Gets into all the details of the capabilities of the tester. When you have finished with this class, you're going to have a great understanding of how to set the tester up, uh, problems that you might encounter in configuring the tester. One of the most helpful things, I have the unfortunate job of having to work with some of my competitors' testers, and sometimes I don't appreciate this enough in our tester. It's really pretty easy to use. The error messages that come out, you're using the wrong adapter, you've set the wrong limit. Read those error messages. We're trying to make the tester easy to work with. The CCTT class does a great job of going through all those details. And also, please take a look online. We have both some uh, recorded webinars and online training. We also have a great knowledge base on our webpage. And I always like to put in a plug for the knowledge base, some of the videos on the knowledge base, because those are very well written and they take into account day-to-day -day situations that you may come across. Uh, hopefully you guys are seeing our trusty Fluke Networks webpage here in the support, in the knowledge base. There are a thousand articles here. We can drill into copper testing. 
we can drill into the DSX cable analyzer and just see a list of, hey, I have a next failure. I have a return loss failure. How can I find that? How do I test with M12D or M12X adapters? Again, Fluke Networks knowledge base is a great place for you to also go and get additional information and from here you will also be able to find some of our video training models modules excuse me that can help you to get started with the tester okay uh, I don't see any additional questions um, That's Jim, great no one ever got upset about us finishing early <laughs> Jim, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I'd like to thank everyone on the call today and on the webinar. Um, we will be sending out a PDF version of the presentation. I know some of the slides may have been uh, clipped off at the bottom slightly, as well as we will send a link to where the recording is so you can listen to Jim once again. If you do have some recommendations or questions specific for us, please send them to webinars, that's plural, webinars, at fluke.com. And I'll make sure that Jim and others uh, can address those questions. And if you, if you weren't able to vote on the poll that you would like somebody to come and talk to you or to contact you, um, we have certain people that said yes, some that said no. Uh, you can ask for that as well on the webinars. I wish to thank you today. Thank you, Jim. Corey, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Take care.